Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to River Glen. To those of you in Waukesha, joining us in Pewaukee. And let's give a big hand to all of our friends online. We love you guys. You guys are great. We're so glad that you're part of the River Glen family. And we hope that one day you get a chance to come to one of our campuses and check it out. Well, if we have never met, my name's Don. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I'm excited to be here today as we continue in this series called Unsung. We're highlighting some of the unsung heroes in the Bible. We often hear about the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Moses, these amazing leaders, the heroes of our faith. But what about some of the unsung heroes, the people that God used in such big ways, but often their stories are overlooked? These were ordinary men and women, but God used them in extraordinary ways. And here's what I like about this is I love these stories because they tell me that maybe God can do some extraordinary things through somebody ordinary like me and maybe ordinary like you as well. No matter what I've done, no matter what you've done, that God can use us as a part of his story, a part of his greater plan. Well, before we dig into this week's Unsung Hero, I have a question for you. Have you ever had to have a difficult conversation with somebody? You know, the kind of conversation where your stomach gets in knots. Maybe you stay up all night and you're thinking about it. You're trying to predict all the different outcomes. Maybe it's a conversation with your brother or sister. They're dating somebody and you know this person is not right for them. Do you say something or just let them figure it out on their own? Or maybe it's a friend. They're making some bad choices and you know they're heading down this path that could really hurt them. Do you speak up or do you just pray that they wake up before they experience the danger? Or maybe it's work-related. It's somebody at work. Maybe you need to have a conversation with them about their performance. That's a hard conversation to have. Or even worse, what if it's a conversation that you need to have with your boss about their performance? Well, and parents, we all know the very difficult conversation that comes at a certain age with your kids, the one that you both feel unbelievably unqualified to do. We all know what it is. None of us wants to have it. It's the dreaded birds and bees conversation. Very important conversation, but very hard to deliver. Well, I got to tell you, as a parent, there was a time in my life where I had to sit down with my firstborn, my son, and this conversation didn't, didn't go as quite as I planned. My bright idea was to take him to Barnes & Noble and show him some books, kid-appropriate educational books. The thought was, hey, let the book do the talking. What can go wrong there? At the time, it sounded great to me. Like I told my wife, she was way more qualified to probably have this conversation. So I found a quiet place in the store. I sat him down and I pulled out the book and he looked down at the book and he looked back at me and he said, Dad, what are we doing here? Please, not now. I got to tell you, it was a wrong time, wrong place, wrong approach. It was a complete dad fail. These are just some of the crucial conversations we need to have in our life. They're important, they're uncomfortable, and we're going to have to decide, do we have this conversation or do we just let it go? Let me tell you a story that I heard that's about a true person. This was a man named Dave. He had this incredible life. He was a farm kid. He was the youngest of eight. He grew up in the church. Dave was a believer, and he had this great relationship with God. Well, one day, one day when Dave was younger, he left his family and the farm, and he went off to war. He became this incredible soldier. He actually became this war hero. Everyone could see his great leadership skills. He was just really one of those natural-born leaders. And when Dave came home from the war, he got married, and he got into politics. Everybody loved Dave, so he quickly rose to the top. He became famous. Everyone knew him. He had power and wealth, and life was looking great for Dave. Until one night, he sees this woman, a beautiful woman, and he's determined to meet her. And so he reaches out to her. They meet, and one thing leads to another, and Dave ends up taking advantage of her. Now, if that isn't bad enough, this woman is also married. And now this godly man has got himself into this mess, and things are about to even get worse. This woman confronts, confronts Dave and tells him that she's pregnant. And Dave panics and he makes a decision that's going to alter his life forever. He decides that the best approach is to cover it up by getting rid of her husband. What I'm sure Dave thought would be a small misstep in his life has now actually turned to murder. Dave thinks no one's going to know what he's done. He thinks he's in the clear. He's hit it well. 
But guess what? Dave has his friend named Nate, and he finds out about Dave's secret. So I want you to imagine, if you're Nate, what do you do? How do you approach this? Do you say anything at all? I mean, he killed a man. Who knows what he's going to do to you? The easiest thing to do would just be to avoid the confrontation altogether. Stay out of it. Have you ever noticed the harder the conversation, the more that we just really want to sweep it under the rug altogether? Just say, hey, I, it's really not my problem. Let someone else confront him. Plus the Bible, doesn't it say that don't judge, right? It's not my place. God's the person that's going to judge, not me. That can easily be our default. But the Bible also speaks to this idea of loving someone enough that you're willing to have this crucial conversation with them. James 5.19 says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring back that person, remember this, whoever turns the sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And Paul in Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. So sometimes the most loving thing we can do is really just to dress the elephant in the room. I saw a quote this week that said, ignoring the elephant in the room doesn't make it disappear. It only makes it grow larger. So friends, we need to deal with it. We need to love someone enough to have that very difficult and awkward and crucial conversation. As we continue today, be thinking about people that God has put in your life, people that God may be calling you to have that crucial conversation with. And I pray that as we look at our unsung hero in scripture today, that you might be able to find some clues on whether or not you should even be having this conversation. And if we are, how do we do it well? Well, here's the thing about Nate. Nate's name is actually Nathan, and he is our unsung hero today. He's actually found in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter 12. King David, one of the Bible he heroes in the Bible, has found himself in this horrible situation. David sees Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop, so he sends for her. They sleep together. She gets pregnant, and he tries to cover it up by sending her husband to the front lines of the battlefield to be killed. And then David's friend, the prophet Nathan, has this crucial conversation with him. And I think there's a lot to learn from Nathan as we look at how he approached and confronted his good friend David in love. I think the first thing that we can learn in, in this is determine if God's sending you. In 2 Samuel uh, 12, it says that God sent Nathan to David. God is the one that sent Nathan to David. So how do we know that? How do we know if God is the one who's actually sending us, if God wants us to be the individual to have that conversation with this person? Or do we feel that this is just something that we need to address? I think before we act, we need to ask ourselves a few questions to determine if God is the, act is the actual one calling us into this conversation. And I believe the very first thing we need to ask is, is our heart in the right place? Why are we concerned about this individual? What triggered this need to get involved? Are you really wanting to help this individual overcome what they're struggling with? Or is this something that has become somewhat personal to you? What's motivating you? What in the past, maybe in the past this person has wronged you, maybe they were quick to confront you or something that you've done in your life, point out flaws in you, make you feel bad about something that you've done. Could there be a touch of revenge here that in somehow pointing out their flaws, their sins, we maybe feel just a little bit better about ourselves? I think if we're really honest, whether intentional or not, there have been times when we've approached people when our heart was not in the right place, when maybe we came at it with the wrong motives. And we've probably experienced this from others as well, and it hurts, and it's not helpful. And in my experience, sometimes people lash out at others because they've been hurt as well. You've heard it said that hurt people hurt people. And if our heart is not in the right place, God may not be calling us into this crucial conversation. Our motive needs to be restoration, not retaliation. Isn't that how we'd want to be approached? Restoration with someone, not retaliation. Let's look at Galatians 6, 1 again. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. That word there, caught in a sin in Greek, means if you were overtaken by sin. This is not like I caught you sinning. I found out your secret. I got you. I caught you. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that if you see someone caught, like they're in a snare, that this sin that they have is like a trap and the sin is overtaking their life. We want, to, we want to come alongside them. We want to bring them freedom. 
and we want to bring them restoration to their life, that's when we reach out to them. That's when we approach them. So if someone is caught, overtaken by sin, you who are spiritual should restore them gently. Again, the word there, restore them gently in Greek, actually is a carpenter term. This means to renovate, to make better than new, better than it ever was, holy and perfectly restored. So again, why are we coming to them with this crucial conversation? Is it to tear them down or to build them up, to restore them or to make them new? I think before we ever think of approaching someone, we need to pray, God, are you sending me into this crucial conversation? And if so, God, is my heart in the right place? Here's another question we need to ask to determine if God is sending us. Do I have the right kind of relationship with this person? How well do I know this individual? Would they even be open to discussing this with me, having getting feedback from me? Notice in both verses we looked at today, it started out with brothers and sisters. The scripture is assuming we're speaking to people that we already have a relationship with. This wasn't a command to start walking down the street, pointing out people's sins, the wrong that we see in people's lives, throwing out advice like it's candy on Halloween. And I got to tell you, I'm sure we've all experienced as we've all received unsolicited advice from people that we don't know very well. And maybe it felt a little bit like this. Check it out. Have you ever been going about your day, minding your own business and focusing on your own goals? Well, then you need unsolicited advice. If you've ever been involved in a private or personal matter, then you may be entitled to unsolicited advice. Sorry, you shouldn't spend so much time on your phone. It's bad for your eyes. Yeah. So do you? Our team of unqualified, enthusiastic volunteers are on standby nationwide. There's actually quite a lot of sugar in those. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We mind your business. Giving unsolicited advice can be tricky, so I try to sugarcoat it with some stock phrases like, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, or just a little tip. Can I give you a teeny weeny bit of advice? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I think she's tired. Because here at Unsolicited Advice, your business is our business. A lot of people might be unwilling to ask for advice from complete strangers. That's where I come in. You know, you don't have to squeeze the avocado to check if it's ripe. You can tell by just looking at it. Because when you need us least, we're there. I'm like, oh, you're gonna hang out again? <laughs> people can be so ungrateful, you know? They don't realize that you've taken time out of your day to ruin theirs. All, all the way. No, folks, turn up. They don't want to turn. Sorry. And remember, there's no need to call the number on screen. There isn't one. We'll find you. I would probably go for. So, do you reckon? Please, do you reckon? No, no, I don't. Because here at Unsolicited Advice, your business is our business. Okay, good. Uh, that's great, Tom. If we could just try that again a little faster this time. Sorry, to ask for your opinion? I love your business is our business. Here's the thing. If people don't want to hear advice from people they don't know very well, then they definitely don't want to hear our thoughts on the big issues that they're struggling and they're wrestling with. And as Christians, we need to get this right. Too often, we're so quick to point out to the world what we see wrong in people's lives way before we ever spend time even getting to know them. You guys, we have good news. We have the good news of the gospel. Let's lead with that and let's lead with love, which leads us to what does the right relationship even look like? Maybe we need to ask ourselves, does this person invite me to give them accountability? Have there been, there been times in my life where I've shared an area where I was struggling and I've asked people for help. I've asked them to check in on me from time to time to hold me accountable. I've actually given them permission so does this warrant or allow for this kind of conversation? Am I their person's supervisor? Am I their father? Am I close enough to this individual to warrant that level of accountability? One of the things I love about the community of small groups is you get to build those types of relationships over time. You invest in each other. I feel totally comfortable if somebody in my small group felt the need to have a crucial conversation with me because they've prayed for me before. They've made deposits into my life. I trust them to make withdrawals. Nathan had that same kind of relational currency with David. So remember, the greater deposits over time, the better shot that you're going to have that they'll hear that input and pursue that restoration because that is our ultimate goal. Proverbs 27, 6 says, the wounds of a friend can be trusted. So let's recap. Do we have the right heart? 
do I have the right kind of relationship with this person to determine whether or not God is sending me into this conversation? The second thing we can look at and learn from Nathan is to be strategic. Be strategic. Think it through. Have a plan. I am the king of saying one thing in my head and people hearing something completely different, especially in my family. It sounds right up here, but when it comes out of my mouth, not so much. And then I get that look, you know, you guys know that look, and all you can say is, what did I say? Fellows in the room, how many have been there? Well, I got to tell you, my wife, Allison, will remind me, it's not what you said, Don, it's how you said it. Truth is, we've all been there before, and how we say things matters. We can say, I love cooking, my family, and my pets. Or I can say, I like cooking my family and my pets. Those two things mean something completely different. And yes, commas matter, folks. So let's do this exercise together. Turn to the person next to you and say, oh, you're here. Now turn to the person on the other side and say, oh, you're here. Same words, completely different meaning. Now apologize to them. Crucial conversations are hard. They're not easy for us to have. So we need to make sure that we're saying the right things, but we really also need to think about how we say it as well. We need to be strategic. We just don't want to jump into the conversation. We need to take time to think things through. We need to pray about it, maybe take some notes, get our thoughts down on paper. For me, I love to be able to talk with someone that I can trust, get their input and get their wisdom. I find this super helpful for me they often see things that I miss or they give me insight in how this person may perceive the conversation. So we need to be strategic. And I love the strategy that Nathan uses to approach David. Nathan doesn't just barge in, start accusing him, pointing his finger at him. He doesn't even approach the topic gently. Instead, he starts it off with a story. Nathan shares the story with David as if, as if he's asking his thoughts or his opinions on this matter. And the scripture reads in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 7, the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and he grew up with him and it grew up with him and, it, and, and his children. It shared his fo food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David hears the story and we see his response. It says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, this man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are that man. David, you took Uriah's wife, his one and only wife. You, the powerful king, the wealthy king, took that one person that Uriah loved above all else, and you made her your own. And David is crushed. He knows the damage he's done. And then David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I believe that David's quick response to take ownership and show contrition has a lot to do with the strategy that Nathan took. Nathan didn't come in accusatory, guns blazing. Nathan didn't even choose to approach him in a public place where maybe David's defenses would have been up. Instead, Nathan pulls David aside and he shares a story like he's saying, hey, David, how would you handle this person or a situation like this? And David's heart immediately went out to the poor man before he even had a chance to get defensive or explain away his actions. Nathan was strategic and we need to be strategic as well. These are sensitive, crucial conversations. We need to take the time to think it through, plan our approach. We owe that to the people that we're speaking with. And if we want to be successful in planning out our conversation, I think there's some practical things we need to remember if we're going to be strategic. And I think the first one is, Look at our timing. We need to look at the timing of this conversation. That is so important. This is really tough for me. I have to admit, I struggle in this area. I have a tendency to just want to dive in. I love to solve problems. And the quicker we solve it, the better I feel. And the truth is, I need to remind myself it is not about me. I need to slow down. I need to think about the person that I want to speak with. 
I asked a couple people this week, what's the best time to approach you with a crucial or important conversation? I thought they had some great tips. I wanted to share these with you. Here they are. Avoid having a late night conversation when I'm tired. If I'm middle in the middle of something, don't start a serious conversation. You won't have my full attention. That's true for me. Uh, don't hit me with it the minute I come home from work. Uh, I thought this was great. Just tell me you want to meet or talk and ask me what's a good time for me. I think it's all great advice that we can use. So think about the person, their time, their schedule, and also consider if they're emotionally at a point where they can receive what I'm about to say to them. Timing is everything. Another practical strategic tip is express your intent. As you start out the conversation, be affirming, be positive, letting them know that you're coming to them because you care about them. You want them to be successful. Remember, these are people that you have a relationship with. You're, you sharing your feedback, having this crucial conversation is because you want to help bring restoration into their life. The next one is focus on the issue, not the person. This is a big one. Listen, the problem is a problem. The person is not the problem. Remember, it's, it's not you against this individual. It's both of you together against this problem. And this can be really hard, especially if we're close to the situation or the individual. We can, also, we can start to see their problem as an affront to us. Why would they do this to us? Don't they know this affects our relationship, our family, our workplace? And if we start to find ourselves focusing too much on the, on the individual, then maybe we need to ask ourselves, are we the right person to be having this conversation? Remember, we're not coming to them, to this conversation to judge them, to shame them, or coming to restore them. You don't know the person's motive or intent, so let's just focus in on the problem. Nathan held David accountable. David didn't get off the hook, but Nathan's focus was on the problem that David needed to address in his life. Another is ask questions. Questions are a great way to help bring understanding or context to the problem that you're addressing. Sometimes through questions, you might even discover that you don't even have the full picture. But I think the most important thing is that it lets this person know that you care about their situation and the struggle they're in. So I might say, hey, I noticed you said this. Help me understand what you meant. Help me understand why. Ask questions, avoid statements, accusations, declarations. Those are the types of things that are going to bring people's defenses up. And next, do it in person. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And in Galatians 2.11, Paul says, when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. What he did was very wrong. Don't have crucial conversations over text or email. Don't do it. And I've heard the arguments, but Don, you're old. Everybody texts nowadays. Yes, I am old, but don't do it. Trust me, it would be easier if we just did this over email. It allows us both to relax. No, it won't. Don't do it. You can't hear the tone. You don't understand the context. You don't understand the heart of the person involved when you do it over email or text. A relative of mine posted on Facebook that she had been hospitalized. My mom decided to respond on the post with the letters LOL. We came to find out that my mom didn't know that LOL meant laugh out loud. She thought it stood for lots of love. Written conversations can have its risk. Albert Morabian, a researcher uh, of body language who first broke down the components of face-to-face -face conversation, he found that communication was 55% nonverbal, 38% vocal, and only 7% words only. I know it's hard to have a crucial conversation face-to-face. -face. There is anxiety. There is fear for all of us. Our hands just sweat just even thinking about it. But it's not only the smart approach, the better approach, but we owe it to this person to have this conversation directly. And the last one is go to the person in private. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Nathan goes to David in private. He doesn't do it publicly. He isn't addressing it on Facebook or Instagram. And not only address it in private, but Again, be strategic. Find a quiet place that you won't be interrupted. Make it a neutral place where they won't feel uncomfortable. Again, think about them. You want this to be successful. So determine if God is sending you. Be strategic. And then finally, be committed. 
be committed to walk with this person through the journey of restoration and have grace. When David hears the story of the lamb that was taken from the poor man, he is indignant. He is angry. He goes as far as to say, as surely as the Lord lives, this man who did this must die. But when Nathan looks at him and says, you are that man, you are that man, David. David's heart just broke. That rage that was pointed at the rich man, he is now pointing at himself. That guilt, the shame, the embarrassment had to be overwhelming. And David owns it. He admits he sinned against God. He feels like his life is over. His reign as king is ended. Everything that he has built is completely lost. But Nathan looks at him in that very next verse. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. God shows mercy and grace where David showed none. You see, God didn't send Nathan to rebuke him, to say, I caught you. I got you. God sent Nathan to get him back onto the road of healing, to show David God's grace and to help restore him and to walk with him. Nathan walks with David through this restoration, through this process of healing, and their their relationship continues over time. This is what makes Nathan such an unsung hero. This is how we can be an unsung hero in the lives of other people as well. Because if we're going to have crucial conversations with people, then I think we ought to be committed to the restoration process with that person. If I have a friend who's struggling through an addiction, I'm not just going to tell them to go get help. I'm going to tell them, I'll go get help with you. I'm going to walk through that journey with you. I'm going to go to celebrate recovery with you on Monday night. I'm going to be with you through those long, hard days. And if I have an employee that's missing the mark, struggling in the role, my job is to point it out, to bring it to the light. But if they own it like David did, then I need to do everything in my power to help them. I have to be willing to offer more training, provide resources, do everything I can to help them be successful. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. We're called to carry each other's burdens in this world. Before David ever was a warrior and a king, he was a shepherd. And every good shepherd has a staff. The staff would be a, a long stick with a crook on it. And when the sheep started to get off path or leave the flock, the shepherd would use his crook to kind of pull them back into safety, into the fold. But sometimes that didn't work with the wayward sheep. So the shepherd would reach down and pick up the shepherd and put him on his shoulders for safety and take him back to the fold. And then he would carry him to the watering hole, taking them, talking to them the whole time. The strategy was that over time, the sheep would learn to trust the shepherd's voice. And sure enough, when put down, those were the sheep that you would often see closest to the shepherd. We can determine that God is calling us. We can be strategic, but we need to be committed to the restoration process, helping and carrying people to the other side. We have a God who loves us so much that he sent his son, the good shepherd, to offer us life, to give us freedom from our sin and to walk along with us through this restoration process. Let's live that out in the conversation that we have with others. Let's reflect on what Christ has done for us so that we can speak Christ to others.